Um, uh, so as uh, Radhik said, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the optical nanoscopy group um, at UIT. And uh, like last month, Ida was talking about uh, the mitochondria research that she does in super resolution work. Um, uh, my work is mainly towards three dimensional uh, imaging of thick samples. And uh, when we're talking of thick samples, um, uh, different optical component, uh, optical microscopes come into our mind. But today's focus of my talk would be mostly towards label-free imaging, although I will discuss relevance of uh, label techniques as well. So ever since we, our I have learned about microscopy, I, microscopy and biological research have kind of co-evolved with each other. And uh, uh, the initial microscopes were visualizing bacterial cells or plant cells or simpler structures. But as we as a society grew, our questions became more complex and more complete. And in order to address those complete and complex questions, we needed to work with models that can encapsulate all these parameters of complexity and completeness. So, and also taking into con consideration the time efficiency and the um, reproducibility of the experiments, and therefore the onset of three-dimensional biological models. So today's talk will focus on the different three-dimensional models that uh, exist, and some of which I am currently working with uh, in our group. So as you can see, uh, the, the first type or the most simplest form of three-dimensional models are 3D cell cultures. These are just cells suspended in a three-dimensional matrix. So any kind of 3D, 3D cell culture technique uh, is definitely superior than any monolayer culture or 2D culture is because it has the 3D ambience to work with and therefore closer to the actual animal or human system. So in 3D culture systems, we are... Um, So in 3D culture systems, we are uh, we can study the effect of the matrix. It can be stiffness, it can be porosity, it can be several of these matrix properties that can be studied uh, with cells embedded in them. Spheroids are a bit more advanced version. They are representatives of cell from a particular organ, but they are not well organized. They are bundled together in a bunch and they are very good uh, models to for drug screening or uh, especially for diseases like cancer. Uh, the third type of 3D uh, in vitro system is uh, engineered tissues. And the engineered tissue that you can see here is uh, engineered heart tissue or EHTs. EHTs are heart tissues that are, are taken from human cells, uh, human skin cells, converted to stem cells, and they are differentiated into cardiomyocytes and allowed to grow on a 3D substrate uh, in a suspended form. And they gradually acquire this beating morphology. And this can be used to study several biological mechanisms, as well as in screening for different therapeutic targets. When we come to more advanced form of 3D in vitro systems, we have organoids. Organoids also have a bunch of cells representing an organ like uh, that of spheroids. The only difference is that these are well compartmentalized. They have different compartments for different cells and therefore are almost a sparser representation of an organ. So therefore we sometimes often call them mini organs because they span several micrometers to several millimeters in dimension. And of course we have uh, tiny animals and by tiny animals, I mean the ones that can be trackable by microscopes like zebra fishes or drosophila or larva of several worms. Uh, so these are easy to study. The, the, advantage of using whole animal systems is that they have other systems to support like the circulatory system or the immune system or 
uh, the the nervous system, which cannot be present in systems like organoid, but organoids can be derived from human cells and therefore are more relevant for clinics. So this is where we kind of do uh, trade work based uh, tra uh, uh, on on uh, what kind of model we use for our particular study. So what are the imaging considerations? for 3D in, in vitro systems. So we have two kinds of systems if we can broadly classify. One is the label-free system and one is the label system. And when it comes to molecular studies, we always lean more towards label systems because they, are, uh, they have specificity to offer. And because they have specificity to offer, we can do targeted studies. However, epifluorescent systems cannot be quantified and hence, uh, uh, we use systems that can perform optical sectioning like confocal microscopes, and therefore we can quantify the results of protein expressions. However, these systems, confocal systems, often are phototoxic, and we cannot do long-term experiments on that. And thus, to meet that uh, kind, to mitigate that kind of a gap, light sheet microscopes came into the picture where they are quite gentle on these labeled samples or samples in general. So, however, they also come with their own disadvantages, which we will discuss a little later. But on the other hand, we have the all um, uh, the whole world of label-free systems. Label-free microscopes are very old. We know about phase contrast and DIC microscopes. They have been existing for a while now. However, they are not quantitative in nature. And at this point, when we are doing analysis for biomedical applications, we need things to be quantitative. And therefore, quantitative phase imaging method was uh, came into the picture. However, they are not very good with thicker samples. And therefore, we have what is known as the gradient light interference microscope, which I will discuss in more details today, uh, because it specifically is kind of an optical sectioning uh, uh, analog uh, for label-free phase imaging. So a little bit about what we do in our lab is we grow what is known as a 3D culture system on a slide. So as you can see that there's a slide and you'll see a bunch of arrays of matrices. These matrices have different properties and cells are grown in those matrices. And we do a confocal imaging of uh, the molecules that we labeled it with. So we have mitochondria and actin cytoskeleton. And this these cells are kind of uh, submerged inside these 3D matrices, which are about 100 micrometers thick. And the advantage of this is that we can create these arrays of uh, hydrogels of different mechanical properties or different physical properties. And therefore we can do studies of the effect of matrix on the cells, which can be relevant to several diseases like fibrosis or cancer, for example. However, uh, uh, confocal microscope definitely comes. Uh, so we are using a line scanning confocal instead of a point scanning confocal because of the reduced dwell time and overall reduction of phototoxicity. However, light sheet microscope offers a very good trade-off here because uh, the illumination is on a thin sheet and therefore it is not bleaching the entire sample at a time. And therefore we can achieve optical sectioning with gentleness. Uh, over the years, uh, however, light sheet microscopes did not originally were, were not the most user friendly because the samples had to be put in a certain way uh, to, for them to be imaged. So the first conventional light sheet microscope had to be orthogonally placed and therefore it was very difficult to put samples in that small space. So there was a lot of limitation and restrictions in that. Gradually, we had open top light sheet microscope systems, which had both the illumination and the uh, emission uh, objectives on the same side. So the other side was open to keep samples. So this was an open top light sheet microscopy system. However, uh, further development led to OPM or oblique plane light sheet microscopy in which they use a single objective lens. 
on which the same objective lens is used to illuminate the sample at a certain angle, as well as collect the emitted fluorescence uh, from the same sample. And therefore, we have more and more developments of light sheet microscopy that enables uh, flexibility of uh, keeping the samples while doing 3D volumetric imaging. Now, I will talk about a very unique system that I started and that we are currently working with in our lab. And that is engineered heart tissue. And why this is a very unique problem is because it has all the problems microscopy has to deal with. One is, it is a structure that is not completely, uh, that has a lot of scattering. So it has a lot of these fibril structures, a lot of fibrinogen, and this causes a lot of scattering. And scattering is a cause of a lot of noise in the images. At the same time, it is a constantly moving structure. It is a beating structure. And this beating motion is quite fast. Imagine beating of a heart while we are trying to capture Z stacks of these images. And these are also thick samples. The thinnest part of these engineered heart tissues is one millimeters. So it has these problems, even though it is a very miniaturized version and a very, very simplified version of a heart tissue, it still has so many challenges that need to be overcome. And therefore, Labeling required, uh, so uh, we did attempt to uh, do protein-based uh, so, uh, uh, protein based labeling. However, we saw that we needed to fix the sample in most of the cases to do any kind of a functional assessment of what is happening here or morphological assessment. So the next solution for us to can we go for a label free technique to quantify the changes that are happening in the engineered heart tissue and of particular importance to our group was to see the kind of maturation of this heart tissue when they are forming. So for that we thought that let us explore label free phase imaging and label free phase imaging started with a phase contrast microscope then uh, DIC, and both of these imaging techniques are not quantitative. However, if we are trying to do any kind of a functional or morphological assessment of the engineered heart tissues, we need to go for quantitative label-free imaging. And quantitative phase imaging was a solution, but it does not give us any kind of depth information or it does not uh, give us uh, information beyond uh, when the object is highly scattering. And therefore, we found a very good solution to this, which is called radiant light interference microscope. And the first paper was published by Gabriel Popescu's group in 2017. And now we have a system in our lab, uh, which has a glim and uh, line scanning confocal on the same system. The advantage of using GLIM is that it can image thick samples while they are living condition and that too quantitatively. And in today's further discussion, I will show how this GLIM can be utilized for imaging and analysis. So the basis of GLIM is it captured phase information and, the, uh, and it captured up at the image plane it captures these four intensity images with the help of a lens apparatus. And then they reconstruct these images to give, give a 3D reconstruction almost uh, like DIC, but quantitative in nature. So this is the first results of engineered heart tissue. So we took the engineered heart tissues and you can see that these are the, uh, these banded structures that we can see in the Z stack are the sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are the proteins that have these banded structure and give very good contrast with quantitative contrast imaging technique like GLIM. You can see that these banded structures are very clear. And hence, it gave us a way to kind of um, understand the maturation because as the EHTs mature, the sarcomeres arrange themselves differently. And this arrangement can be quantified now and can be studied for 
uh, different kind of heart conditions, which can be simulated inside the EHDs. Uh, uh, because the EHTs uh, uh, can be imaged uh, uh, correlatively, uh, we have done correlative with fluorescence uh, with this, and we found that at least resolution-wise, we can see nucleus, uh, which are very close to the DAPI staining here on the right-hand side. And uh, this is kind of the composite of the two. And we can see at least from these images, the sarcomeric protein structures and the nucleus at this point. However, I will also like to bring your attention to some of the other uh, uh, research groups that have been working with GLIM uh, uh, and how they use GLIM for their applications. So this is a bovine embryo and this bovine embryo is treated with something that will cause the embryo to die eventually. However, uh, so the, the death of this embryo could be quantified based on the intensity. So they have uh, uh, found a function which they call DIM and DIM kind of reduces if the cells are dying eventually. So they have used the, uh, the imaging as a quantitative tool to assess cell death or embryo death over time. So it is very important for uh, viability of embryo in clinics and that kind of study. And they have also been able to uh, get 3D reconstruction of embryo. So this is, I believe, a four-celled embryonic stage um, that has been reconstructed in 3D. So I was talking about spheroids earlier. In our group, we work with liver spheroids and uh, with different kinds of liver cells. This is a uh, uh, embryonic body. And you can see that uh, if you see this image, you can see the nucleus very clearly, but these are not as well organized as a proper organoid is supposed to be. So therefore, I will uh, show you some very good examples of organoids like kidney organoid. So organoids are very good in compartmentalization and that is where they are better than spheroids or any other because there the cells are compartmentalized within a certain boundary, which is very important to study how different uh, therapeutic interventions or different kind of chemical or physical changes can affect the development of different organs. As you can see on the right hand side video that eventually on Z stack we can see this compartment growing or this, this compartment being present. And these compartmentalizing measurement of these compartments for an extended period of time can be a very good feature to extract from GLIM imaging of these organoids. But besides organoids, uh, this imaging method has been used to image small animals, or as I was telling you about, it's just like C. elegans, there is another worm-like animal. And you see that uh, this is around 400 micrometers thick. And with that thickness, it is able to extract very fine details of the organ systems present inside uh, this worm. But what about when the samples are moving very fast? And our question was, in case of engineered heart tissues, the heart was vibrating or kind of beating very fast. How fast beating? can be recorded by GLIM. And a very good example of this is a living, breathing zebrafish uh, heart, which is beating at a very fast rate. And the imaging is fast enough to capture this kind of emotion. And therefore, this kind of imaging would be very good for also tracking uh, uh, moving uh, samples or beating samples. So before I finish, uh, the talk, I would like to conclude by saying that one of the major problems uh, of uh, 
imaging today is uh, uh, that is still kind of in its way of being solved is cattle management is as we go into more and more complex system, we will have to work with a lot of proteins with scatter, for example, collagen. And that is what our body is essentially made up of. And to understand what the scattering is, to understand how it happens and how those scattering can be mitigated or even used to our advantage is something that our group is currently looking into. And that is what I believe is going to make a shift in um, imaging complex systems, which are highly scattering and then tracking them over the period of time. And uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, our scientific team who is involved, who are involved in the research. So we have Marti Do Castella from University of Barcelona. He's working with the uh, uh, imaging uh, by considering scattering into consideration. Uh, Florian Weinberger, he's a medical doctor from UK Hamburg, Germany, and he is uh, so they are the pioneers of making engineered heart tissues, and we are working in collaboration on how we can understand the biology of the heart tissues. Osa uh, is the university uh, is currently affiliated with the University Hospital of UIT, and she is working with the subcellular organelles like mitochondria. And uh, Ida has been working with her as well. Uh, Dipanjan is working on several advanced light sheet microscoping met methods. And so is Florian. Peter is the source of our um, uh, spheroids. Uh, Aisada uh, has been, um, is kind of uh, help us with prototype development of different microscopes. Matthew and Dilip are the AI representatives of our group. And uh, they are helping us to use AI for a better understanding uh, the different features of subcellular behavior in both labeled and label free images. Krishna is, uh, of course, has been uh, working and uh, some of you already know her and she is uh, working with musical for a while and also uh, my supervisor in UIT. And Balpreet works on chip-based nanoscopy and we are working together on several collaborations. So yeah, that's our team. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Biswacha, for the interesting talk. And now we have time for questions. So maybe uh, I will start uh, with one question. What is mm -hmm. the, the wavelengths you use in the your quantitative phase imaging? Uh, they use the visible light. Uh -huh. uh, can you use infrared light? Currently, uh, they don't use infrared light. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but I see if you are talking about the depth of penetration, Right. can be increased if infrared can be used perhaps but currently their systems do not use that mm -hmm. but hmm. I'm, I'm thinking like, is there any in principle reason because I, I don't think so there should be unlike in fluorescence you mm -hmm. this yeah. For yeah. Any, I agree any I agree. Right. so that's one obvious direction how to mitigate the effects of scattering Yes, absolutely. Any other, any other questions to, to the talk or possibly to other topics? Hi, uh, nice talk. Thank you. So um, I'm trying to understand the quantitative part of the this, this mm -hmm. technique because I am still not able to, to understand what is the quantitative part. For example, you have this example where, where the cell is dying and they have this black mm -hmm. regions. Are there any examples of people trying to do quantitative uh, you, you, using this technique? Because, I'm, because what you see on the 
picture uh, an overall view of all the organelles, all the proteins that's, that's inside. Um, unlike fluorescence, which is more specific, and when you mm -hmm. talk about quantitative, yeah. you know that it's, when it's brighter, there's a, a lot of that protein being expressed. But on, mm -hmm. on this, this type of imaging, I'm trying to wrap my head over, uh, trying mm -hmm. to understand what is the quantitative part of this? What, what does the dark and the light part of the image mean? Yeah, so of course, uh, as you said, that this is uh, not specific um, in general because we are imaging a lot of things at the same time. But what they are claiming in their original paper, which I can share with you, is uh, that they are able to uh, computationally or instrument instrumentally they are able to kind of get uh, or kind of uh, model the multiple scattering component and the errors associated with the multiple scattering component. And therefore, they are able to, so we are able to calculate measurements like refractive index from the intensity values. I see, okay. Hmm. So, so if I understand this correctly, so because the quantitative phase imaging, as you said, it gives something, some values like refractive index or related yes. quantities. So this is some sort of an empirical uh, observation that they uh, related the, the changes in the refractive index to the cell death or cell viability. Okay. Is yes. It, is it my understanding correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you.